11, a frightening crash caught on camera. What troopers hope you can learn from this. The community tonight mourns the death of three men who died on a crab boat off the coast of Oregon. He brought love and light everywhere he went. Did a Ducks football workout go too far? A former player is now suing the university and its former coach after he and others got very sick. Plus, a Portland transgender woman gets a humiliating message on her phone. Does that look like a guy or a girl? Like a guy. <laughs> and it came from her doctor's office. Our top story, a tragedy at the coast. A community gathered tonight to remember the fishermen who died when their boat capsized in rough seas. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Porter. And I'm Dan Haggerty. This happened in Yaquina Bay off the coast of Newport. KGW's Mike Benner joins us now with more on the impact one of them had on that Newport community. And Dan, we say one of them because the other two are from the East Coast. But Joshua Porter called the Newport area home, specifically the small town of Toledo. Porter's described as kind and loving, the sort of guy who would do anything to help someone out. Tonight, he and two others are gone and a fishing community is reeling. Yeah, he was just at the house holding our grandkid. Love that guy, man. At the Yoquina Bay Lighthouse Wednesday night, a crowd gathered to remember fisherman Joshua Porter of Toledo, Oregon. He was kind and gentle and loving and giving, and I mean, he would help whoever he could. So it should come as no surprise that Porter decided to help two New Jersey men who had very little to no experience crabbing out west. All three were on board the Mary B-2 vessel late Tuesday night when a storm hit. They tried making it back to the marina in Newport. When they squared up or turned to sea in the position they were in, they were over the submerged north reef of Yaquina Bay Bar, and they took about a 20-foot uh, breaker over the bow. The Mary B-2 capsized. Unfortunately, rescue efforts were unsuccessful. All three men died. Josh, he's a great guy. I mean, I've known him for a lot of years. Um, we've gotten really close in the fishing community. We've traveled all over the place together. This man believes he was the last person to talk with Porter. They texted back and forth as the storm worsened. So in your text, you're saying, why are you going out? We're coming in. This is too yeah. dangerous. Yeah, pretty much. And he's, he asked us why we were getting towed in. So it was just a bad day yesterday. This is all that's left of the Mary B-2 vessel. For those at the Aquina Bay Lighthouse Wednesday night, a reminder that the livelihood of so many in this community can take a turn in an instant. It impacts the fishing community. Joshua Porter is survived by his wife. Unfortunately, we don't know much about the New Jersey men, only that they loved crabbing enough to come out west to pursue it. Our thoughts with all three families tonight. Exactly. Thank you, Mike. Developing tonight, Portland police are investigating after one of their officers saw a man get hit by a car. It happened right in front of the officer's cruiser on Southeast Powell near 166th. The man was crossing the road at the time. He's now in the hospital with serious injuries. The driver did stay on the scene and is cooperating with investigators. New tonight, a transgender woman says she was mocked and judged by staff members at a local medical office. She heard it all on an extended voicemail, a staff member left by mistake. KGW's Catherine Cook sat down with the woman who got that message in an interview you'll see only on eight. Catherine. Well, Laurel, that message left her shocked and hurt. She filed a complaint with Kaiser Permanente, which is at the center of this incident, but she hopes her story leads to change on a broader level where others deal with similar mistreatment every day. Jackie Mountner lives an active life, whether she's building bike frames for a living or skateboarding for fun. That's how she fractured her foot. But Jackie's life, which she lives as a transgender woman, took a turn last week with a voicemail from her podiatrist's office. Hello, this message is for Jackie Mautner. This is Dr. Heck's office at Kaiser. Kaiser Permanente Mill Plain One Medical Office in Vancouver. The woman finished her message and thought she'd hung up. Thank you. Only she hadn't. Listen to what she and a coworker say next about Jackie. Does that look like a guy or a girl to you? It looks like a guy. <laughs> I heard this message, which put me into a bit of shock. The voicemail lasts nearly four minutes. During that time, the women mock Jackie's appearance. It doesn't look like he's on hormones at all. Oh, he should. I know, but I don't think he is. They pull up Jackie's extended medical records, discuss her transition, and refer to her as it. He, she, she uses female pronouns. 
Right, but it was a he. It was a he, yes. But he's got an appointment with neurology to discuss having his mask cut off. Oh, and he still looks like a guy now. It's not just unprofessional, it's just hurtful and demeaning and dehumanizing. And it's not the first time someone's made her feel less than. This was not something that I, I alone experience. It's definitely bigger than Kaiser. In response, Kaiser shared a statement with KGW. It reads in part, Kaiser Permanente is deeply committed to caring for our transgender members. Disrespectful or insensitive comments run counter to our values of treating every patient with compassion and dignity. Two employees were put on administrative leave on Monday pending the completion of an investigation. Disciplinary action could include dismissal. Jackie hopes hurtful. it doesn't come to and that. If they understand the severity of what they did and are willing to make amends, I would rather these two folks be the kind of uh, seeds of culture change within Kaiser. And besides investigating this specific incident, Kaiser officials tell us they're also looking into how they can improve existing efforts to train and educate staff in providing the best care for transgender patients. Dan, back to you. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea. Yeah, Jackie is very forgiving about it. Thank you, Catherine. Caught on camera tonight, an example of why you should always move over to the side of the road when you see an officer parked there, uh, or rather move into the road when you see an officer parked on the side of the road. Watch this Florida Troopers dash cam. The car swerves off the road, slams into the back of the cruiser, then the car catches fire. The trooper, who wasn't hurt, was able to pull that driver from the car. That man was seriously hurt, but he did survive, thanks to that officer. This crash happened in December, but the Florida Highway Patrol released the video just today. An end to the government shutdown seems no closer tonight after President Trump stormed out of a meeting today with Democratic leadership. The president wants funding for a border wall. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer say that's a non-starter. That means the government shutdown continues now in its 19th day. It's on track to become the longest in history. But some Republicans may be swaying away from the president's plan. Five GOP senators have now called for an end to the government shutdown. And this Friday, day after tomorrow, federal workers will miss their first paycheck. A question many people have is, can those furloughed federal employees file for unemployment? KGW investigator Kristen Severance verifies that for us. We can verify many of those workers who will not be getting a paycheck until the government reopens can file for unemployment. So our source for this story, Oregon's Unemployment Insurance Division. You can only apply for unemployment if you are furloughed and not receiving a paycheck. So those federal employees who are deemed essential and have been working during the shutdown are not eligible. Here in Oregon, 950 federal employees have applied for unemployment so far. Compare that to 275 last year. The state told us the entire process should take about 21 days from the day you file, but because of the nature of the shutdown, it could actually take longer. Whenever someone files a claim for benefits, we have to get some information from their employer. And because some of the federal agencies uh, have furloughed most of their employees, it's taking more time to get some of that information. And if you are applying for unemployment, you should also be applying for temporary jobs. Back to you. If you have something you'd like our team to verify, you can email them at verify at kgw.com. The family of the man shot and killed by a Portland police officer Sunday says he suffered from schizophrenia and was legally blind, but the officer did not know that when he showed up to the call. We talked with Andre Gladden's cousin today. She says nothing was wrong when he left Sunday morning. Then, six hours later, Gladden was knocking on a stranger's door three miles away. When an officer showed up, there was a scuffle. The homeowner told our news partner, the Oregonian, that the officer used a taser on Gladden. And when he did, Gladden pulled out this knife. The officer fired his gun three times. His cousin and neighbors are frustrated that it ended this way. I think from what you told me that he just didn't know where he was at and he probably was discombobulated and then cops came in and then he felt like he was under attack. Yeah, if he was sitting on somebody's front porch, I, I guarantee you he probably thought he was home. I guarantee you. The officer who shot him is on paid leave, which is standard procedure. The case is currently.